This week on Wealth Track, legendary investment crusader John Bogle discusses the clash of cultures, investment versus speculation, his lifelong battle against the forces of Wall Street greed in his quest to help individual investors get better returns. Investment pioneer and reformer John Bogle is next on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. The company you keep is also the company we keep. Together we help provide a lifetime of guaranteed income and investment solutions. Did you know you can take WealthTrack with you? You can watch full episodes, you can watch the highlights or read the newsletters whenever, wherever. Let me show you how. In your web browser, type in m.wealthtrack.com. That's it. So join WealthTrack whenever and wherever you can. Hello and welcome to this edition of WealthTrack. I'm Consuelo Mack. We have a special treat for you this week, an extended interview with one-of-a-kind investment legend, John Bogle. Jack, as he is known to many of us, is the founder of Vanguard, the low-cost investment giant famous for the index funds which he created there in 1976. His first index mutual fund, now named the Vanguard 500 Index Fund, because it is modeled on the S&P 500, now has over $100 billion in assets, as is its equivalent fund for institutional investors. If combined, they would be the world's largest stock mutual fund. And Vanguard itself is now managing around $2 trillion in assets, making it the largest mutual fund company in the world. And it's growing rapidly because of its low cost, largely passive investment model. Called a mutual company, Vanguard is the only mutual fund company owned by its fund investors, not private or public stockholders. And Bogle set it up that way to, as he puts it, ensure it would act as a pure fiduciary, putting the interests of its investors first. Now one measure of that goal is cost. According to Vanguard, the average expense ratio for its stock funds is 0.2% of the assets under management, or 20 basis points. 100 basis points equals 1%. Now that compares to the industry average of 0.79%, or 79 basis points, nearly three times more. And fees that actively manage funds are usually considerably higher than that. Now investors are taking note the well-publicized withdrawal from more expensive, actively managed funds into index funds has accelerated over the last two decades and exploded in the last couple of years. From $26 billion in 1993, traditional index funds now have over $1 trillion in assets. They are much younger and incredibly popular offspring, exchange-traded funds, which are index funds traded like stocks, have exploded from $464 million at their launch in 1993 to well over a trillion now, surpassing their older mutual fund brethren. In total, index funds make up 28% of total stock fund assets and counting. From the very beginning of his career, Jack Bogle has been a tireless advocate for individual investors and an outspoken critic of much of the money management industry. It's the focus of his 10th and he says last book titled The Clash of the Cultures, Investment versus Speculation. I began the interview by asking Jack about the changes that have occurred in the industry during his 60 plus year career and what it was like when he started in the business in 1951 at the actively managed and still thriving Wellington Fund. One is we were small as an industry. Wellington Fund was probably one of the 10 largest funds. It was $140 million. We probably employed about 40 people in the company. Uh, and we had one fund, one fund. And so everybody knew the research people, uh, the administrative people, the marketing person. Everything was focused on that one fund. That was our, our, other people's money. And we had a fiduciary duty to those people, and we honored it very well. Wellington Fund was noted for a low cost noted for balanced investing, mixed between bonds and stocks, very consistent over the years, uh, and uh, very much dedicated to serving the investor. Long-term investment philosophy, uh, in a very low portfolio turnover, and I 
I and any, anybody else that was working there got the history of the fund, how it got through the 30s, how it got through the 40s, post-war period, all up to 1951. And it's kind of interesting that uh, I got there in 1951, and here it is, 2012, and I've been there ever since. Now I'm just a senior chairman right now. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, honorary chairman. Uh, but uh, the, I've been associated with that one fund all that time, and I know it like the back of the hand. There's a good story there if we can talk about it later. So when you're talking about you, had, you knew you had a fiduciary duty to your, your shareholders, what did that mean to you back then? And well, that's a great question because I'm not sure we used the word fiduciary. We might have used the word trust, but we knew what our job was. It was to serve the Wellington shareholders. And that's, you know, if you actually just understand that concept, that came first, and that's in the form of a sound investment program, a careful one, a long-term focus, and very low cost. And, you know, if you don't have those kind of things, you're not observing uh, fiduciary duty, and you're not earning the shareholders' trust. And so the fund burgeoned in growth, uh, but what happened to the industry is it went from back then two and a half billion dollars to 12.5 trillion dollars today. It grew up. Big uh, and business. Big business. Uh, then it was pretty much organized by professionals who ran money, not marketers. And, and, and you talk about the distinction in, in, in the book that you talk about this clash of cultures is that there was, there's an investment state of mind and an investment profession and that you're saying that profession has now become a business and it's become one of speculation. So, so what's happened? Take, take us through the evolution because again, you started in 1951 when it was small and it was fiduciary and it was a professional investment business. Marketing was over here and management was over here. Salesmanship was over here and stewardship was over here. And to, to just moderate the phrase you mentioned a minute ago, in those days, it was a profession with aspects of a business. Today, it's a business with aspects, and I think too few, of a profession. Now that change comes by growth. The old mom and pop professional industry was a great big industry run by not investment professionals, but by corporate managers, and in, in too far too great an extent. And uh, it also happens along the way that instead of one fund, you now have a large fund complex may have 200, 250, even 300 different funds. How can a fund director have fiduciary duty to 300 different funds? Indeed, a little bit tongue in cheek, how many mutual funds directors can name all of the funds they're directors of? And I will tell you the answer to that question is zero. Uh, so I have a little lower test. How many fund directors can tell you the number of funds uh, that they're director of? And I guess the answer to that might be a tenth of one percent. So the idea of fiduciary duty has been superseded by this idea of marketing, making things that will sell rather than selling what we make is the way I phrase it. And so if some, a bunch of investors seem to want some new kind of a leverage thing or you know, a short-term focused fund, whatever it might be, uh, give them one. What is marketing? Marketing, the classic definition is finding out what the public wants and giving it to them. I could spend a hundred years trying to find a better def definition of what a mutual fund company should not be. Uh, so, so what should a mutual fund company be? And you founded Vanguard, which is now a very large mutual fund company, and it has many different funds. So you know, what should a mutual fund company be? Is it possible to still have a fiduciary standard among the money managers and still have a big marketing arm that really doesn't have a lot to do with the money managers except to represent the funds yep. that they're managing. I mean, can't you do both? Well, it's very difficult to do both. Uh, the fund, just to be clear, the management company has its own officers and directors. And there often may be, the vast majority of mutual funds have uh, management companies that are owned by financial conglomerates. And these financial conglomerates are in business to earn the highest possible return on their capital. And what you want as an investor in one of their mutual funds is to earn the highest possible return on your capital. 
So when you think about it, those two things, because of fees and cost and turnover expenses and all the things that go on in marketing, uh, are opposed to one another. You can't do both. Or as a book we've all read carefully says, no man can serve two masters. So the structure of the industry is inherently flawed, and it will have to change. How does it have to change? And realistically, how can it change? Let me start there. OK. Uh, I'll give you two answers, two ways it can change that I've thought of. One is what I call the Adam Smith solution. And that is if each investor looks after his own best investment interest and puts the, monies with the, firm, the money with the firms that best serve his own interest, then the industry will change. Because he's demand a long-term focus. He's going to demand prudent management. He's going to demand low expenses. Uh, he's going to demand to get his fair share of whatever returns the fund makes, his or her fair share of whatever returns the fund makes. Name names. There are some funds out there that represent the kind of values that you think there serve investors. There are some investors. funds, very few. Uh, I like Longleaf down in the South. They run the funds as fiduciaries. I like Dodge and Cox out in the West Coast. They run the funds as fiduciaries. And they aren't firms that have 200 mutual funds to run. They might have four, five, six, something like that. And so they can do it that way. They have an international stock fund, domestic, and so on. Uh, so they can do that. And, and another firm that I certainly think highly of is T. Rowe Price, who's having a very good performance streak at the moment. Won't last forever, I'm sure. But they could, they could uh, so easily reduce their management fees uh, because uh, they're just, they make an awful lot of money. And instead of keeping it for themselves, the management company and, and its officers and publics, they've got public stockholders. And it's the no man can serve two masters again. I tell the story in my book about how about, let me say, 15 years ago, I wanted to keep my tab, my eye on certain mutual fund companies that had public stock. So about 100 shares of T. Rowe Price for $4,000. Last year, I got a dividend from T. Rowe Price of $4,200. This is a profitable business. The capital value of that little investment is probably $350,000 now. And that's great for the shareholders of T. Rowe Price, but if some of that money had gone to the fund shareholders, their performance, which I want to emphasize has been good recently, uh, would have been even better. So the conflict comes up again and again. So the Adam Smith solution is moving your money to people you can trust. So Jack, in fact, and you and I have talked about this before, investors are making decisions and they are moving, they are voting with their feet. And they are moving from actively managed funds to index funds, right. passive funds, which you, an industry that you created. So tell me about that movement and what's that, what is that is telling you? Well, it's absolutely stunning because in the last six years, the industry has had $200 billion taken out of equity funds, okay? That consists of $600 billion going into index funds and $800 billion going out of actively managed funds. That is not, that is, that is a tsunami. <laughs> I hope I got that one right. You did. Uh, that's a tsunami. So, so the Adam, fees really matter fees a really, lot. The correlation, of, the one thing everybody agrees on is costs matter. And even Morningstar, the eminent mutual fund rater, says that if you just look at a fund's cost, you will do a better job in selecting future winners than you will if you follow their somewhat complex recommendations. So that's a concession, and that's good in their part because it's true. Uh, so that's the Adam Smith solution. Investors act. The invisible hand changes the system. We spend a lot of time on WealthTrack f identifying active managers who are invested in their own funds, who put their shareholders first because they're shareholders too, and who have a, a history over the long term, let's say 10-year compounded returns, of outperforming the market. So in the one area of human endeavor, why are, do you think that in, we can't expect some human beings to do better than the market on a, you know, a, over the long term? Well, why exclude them? History is not kind to that idea. And a big part of my, my new book is about reversion to the mean, the fact that above average managers become below average managers and then average managers. And I have eight charts in the book, and I compare the cumulative return of, of the eight major big performing funds of the last, of the modern era, really, and uh, with, with the S&P Standard & Poor's 500 stock index. And every chart looks like it'd be laid on every other. 
beating the index, beating the index, the beating the index, losing the index, losing the index, losing, and ending up exactly even to the market. This is an expectation, and actually they'll often lose because of the cost, but the pattern, when you go through that chapter of the book, you'll say, I've seen this somewhere before. <laughs> <laughs> so it's hard to pick managers in advance. And part of the reason it's hard is we look back and say we expect managers to do in the past what they've done in the future. And that becomes somewhat ridiculous for, for almost everybody. We kept the, let's see, the uh, April 2000 edition of Money, of Money Magazine. And it was laced with ads saying our five-year average return is 43%, or we earned 105% as the era of the great boom in technology stock. And I think the average gain over the market was maybe, say, 30% a year. 30% a year. Uh, and uh, five years later, those funds had all gone down. Reversion to the mean. Reversion to the mean. And below, well, these were hot funds. And uh, you know, they just go. You know, they're on, the, on, the, on, the, on a very bad track. And so they go out of business. And what a lot of people don't realize when they look at history, they say, well, the mutual funds haven't done that badly over the last 10, 15 years. Half of them have gone out of business. You don't see their records. You see the records of the other half that are surviving. Survivor bias. And so you think, pretty good industry. Well, not if you look at people who are investing in 100% of the funds. And then there's the other the mathematical fact. The markets are quite efficient, not perfectly. Managers compete with each other. They all believe they're above average, naturally. They all believe they can beat the market. But the reality is that over the, the mutual fund managers are, by definition, average. They have to be, because they own all the stocks in America as a group, pretty much. And so if somebody's winning, somebody else is losing. And to make matters worse, they're losing. Some win and some will lose. But that's when you look at the returns before cost, look at them after cost. Same pattern that I described earlier. So, you know, it's nice to think we can pick good managers. I hope your guests prove to stay the course and win. But I just check them out a little bit every five years. Or so. <laughs> <laughs> so talk about this speculation that you're talking about in the clash of cultures, investment versus speculation. What oh. is the speculation environment that you think is so damaging to individual investors? And what's your evidence that it is so damaging? Well, of course, there's plenty of evidence. I mean, the stock market, when I came, in, came into Wellington Fund, was probably trading 5 million shares a day. And today it's trading, I don't know, 6, 7, 8 billion shares a day, depending on the day. Five and, so, and what's wrong with that? I mean, what, why is that bad for individual investors? Well, what it means is, I mean, you don't have to participate in it. That's the beauty of the index fund. But it means that investors' trading costs alone are going to cost probably somewhere between half a, half a percent a year, just the turnover costs. I see. And one and a half percent. And then to get these great managers, you're going to be paying them an average, probably one and a quarter percent, something like that. So all of a sudden, you've got two percentage points out of your return, just out of cost, many of which are generated by high turnover. Mutual fund turnover, when I came into this business, was about 18 uh, percent a year. Now it's 100 percent. So it costs them, but it has to cost, because it obviously, think about this for a minute. There's no basis for investors to win if I'm trading all the time with you uh, because your fund is going to win or lose or my fund is going to win or lose. But the net value created is what's siphoned out of that by Wall Street, the great croupier of the, of, of the market casino. And so you know, there's just no way of getting around that. Now let me give you another more, in a way, more poignant and broader example. Uh, everybody agrees that I've talked to and everybody knows anything about economics. And people, people in the business, Lloyd Blank Fine of Goldman Sachs, if I can use him as an example, maybe reluctantly, agrees, Mary Shapiro, the same thing, chairman of the SEC, uh, that the function, the principal function of the financial markets is for them, what I call uh, the financial system, that provides the oil that greases the wheel of capitalism. So let's think about that. Uh, we're supposed to be directing new capital to its highest and best and most profitable uses. And we do that at Wall Street. Each year, about $250 billion, Wall Street raised about $250 billion uh, to direct to the most promising companies, either initial public offerings or secondary public offerings, each year. And that seems like a lot of money. So we'll call that investment. And you say, well, that's not peanuts. In fact, it is peanuts compared to the amount of speculation in the market. 
when we trade, gamble, speculate, that's all it is, trading stocks with one another, they don't go anywhere, and paying off the casino croupiers, we do $33 trillion. So what this means is, if you want to look at it in that rather harsh mathematical way, that 99.2% of what Wall Street is doing is speculation, and 0.8%, less than 1%, is long-term investment. In your book, the Clash of Cultures, you have 10 investment rules for individuals. Time is your friend. What do you mean by that? Think of the value of compounding. Get yourself out a little compound interest table and see that at 7% money doubles every 10 years and then it doubles again and then it doubles again and then it doubles again and doubles again and doubles again. And by the time you're at retirement age, if you start investing when you're 50, it's multiplied, you'll have to tell me, but let me say uh, 35 or 40 times over. Unbelievable. Maybe even more than that. Three, buy right, hold tight. Okay, buy right, hold tight means don't make mistakes at the start. Pick a good fund and hold it through thick and thin. And I would argue very strongly if you're looking at an actively managed fund, and you should be very careful to buy the low cost ones even if it's actively managed, that don't get despondent when it does badly because it comes and goes. There's no escaping risk. Think about that for a minute. I don't like the risk in the stock market. So put your money in a savings account, a certificate of deposit. There's no risk there. Wait a minute. The return there is probably going to be about 1.5%, and we're going to have 2.5% inflation. So the real return is essentially, and this has been true all over history, that the return on a savings account, the nominal, not the nominal return, the real return, the nominal return of, say, 1.5% at the moment, very, very low, uh, turns into a real ret return of minus 1%. Forget the needle, buy the haystack, you buy the whole market. Why? Yeah, well, it's, uh, because buying a good manager is like looking for a needle in a haystack. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody knows what that's about. Uh, good old Don Quixote had it about right. And uh, so it just makes common sense. Own the whole market and not just a few stocks. That's a, you don't need to take the risk of individual stocks. Take the market risk, which is quite high enough. You don't take both. Uh, the hedgehog beats the fox. The fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one great thing. And in our business, the foxes are all those managers who are smarter, they got all those computers, all those brilliant Harvard Business School graduates, armies of them, and they know everything. And they know far more than I could dream of knowing. I know one great thing, and that is if you own the market, which they do collectively, naturally, uh, if you own the market, you are guaranteed in a low-cost index fund, you are guaranteed to earn your share, fair share of whatever the stock market is kind enough to give us, and let's be very clear on this, whatever return the, a bad market is mean-spirited enough to take away from us. So it's the hedgehog who wins, and the poor fox with all his wiles and his marketing department who figures out what everybody wants, all those crazy things that go on in our business, he's yesterday, and he's going as fast as I can get rid of them. <laughs> and and the, your final rule for investors is stay the course. The markets are really, just think about this for a minute, really counterintuitive because when do you feel you're most optimistic and most happy and enthusiastic about buying stocks? At the market peak. <laughs> when are you scared to death about stocks and really want to get out at the market bottom? So you get in at the top and out in the bottom. Do you think you're going to do well doing that? So figure out a sound program, set the right course, and then don't let all these superficial, emotional, momentary things get in your way. Another way of putting it is don't do something, just stand there. <laughs> <laughs> so Jack, the one investment that we should all own in a long-term diversified portfolio, what would you recommend that we all own some, something of? Total stock, total US stock market index fund. Period. And I have to say, Jack Bogle, you are an investment giant. You are a tireless advocate for the individual investor. And I can't thank you enough for staying the course throughout your many decade career. We are all the better for it. So thanks so much for joining us on Wealth Track. I love your closing line. <laughs> and thank you. It's great to be with you. At the conclusion of every Wealth Track, we give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is a no-brainer. It is Reed Jack Bogle's new book, The Clash of Cultures. 
investment versus speculation. It represents the professional and personal philosophy and history of one of the all-time investment greats. No one has fought longer or harder to return the investment profession that he loves back to its fiduciary investor-first roots. The Clash of Cultures is destined to be another Bogle investment classic. Well, next week, as public television embarks upon its winter fundraising campaign, WealthTrack might be preempted in many markets. So we are going to revisit our two-part series on impact investing, how to match your investments with your values with advice from two socially responsible investing pros. And if you would like to watch this program again, please go to our website, WealthTrack.com. Premium subscribers can see future programs 48 hours in advance, and additional interviews with WealthTrack guests are available in our WealthTrack Extra feature. And that concludes this edition of WealthTrack. Thank you for watching, and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. Additional funding provided by Loomis Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally, and Wintergreen, your home for global value. Thank you.